Hello, everybody. This is Theo Lister with the next segment. Let me share the presentation and get started. So actually, quite interestingly, as, as we, we come to this, talking about the product pipeline and what can come, and of course, it's a useful distinction to have at this point what the difference between a, a pipeline and the roadmap is. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of talk over the past week about companies that exist as feature factories and, and what that quite means. And the, the general take on feature factories is, you know, it's a pro, it's an organization that is solely focused on features and will effectively produce a, a spreadsheet of, of wants and then slap due dates against them and then just start going which it, it can be easy to see companies in that vein if there's no underlying vision or underlying strategy to what the company seems to be trying to accomplish. Uh, but that is of course counterpointed against the fact that features really matter. The, um, the exercise used here is the 2019 launch of the iPad version of Photoshop where it got completely panned and Adobe's chief product officer effectively said, this is a, a humbling lesson in the fact that when you do ship an MVP, you have to be ready for the, the negative criticism that comes out of that. And in that case, it was that critical features were miss missing like filters, pen tools, vector drawings, color spacing. So it becomes something of a balance where companies can't be seen as feature factories but also have to produce features and, and understand where that comes in. And I don't have any neat answer for that. It's a balancing act of having a vision and executing on the features needed. But what I'm, what I'm gonna talk about here with a little more detail may go some of the way towards creating a more nuanced understanding of that. And that would be if you build your product pipeline properly, then you start to get to a point where you're solving the right questions and you're, you're building the features needed, but with furtherance of, of your company's vision. So not all companies refer to this the same. Uh, I quite like referring to the product pipeline because it's, it gives you that understanding of how something progresses from the idea stage to something that comes out as a concrete feature. Uh, but of course, there's, there's so many different possible entry points into the product roadmap or the development pipeline. So, so this is a fairly standard sales pipeline. People live and die by this, but this is, this is where the idea comes from. Uh, effectively, you have all of your leads being sourced through multiple different reasons. So this might be you know, inbound email, it might be uh, seeing somebody at an event, cold outreach. There's, there's so many different ways that information, and in this case, prospects or potential leads come into a company. And then there's this process of curating and processing them. So qualification, dealing with the, the leads that probably aren't going to go anywhere. The, the, the best way of, of focusing your efforts is to only really continue with those prospects that seem like they are interested or they have particular needs that you feel you're able to meet. And then, and so on and so on and so on, and you can get to the bottom of the triangle. And then the sale happens for a, a, small, a smaller proportion the, of the inbound leads. Uh, you're only gonna get a fraction of the people that come in. And I, I see the product pipeline as something, something quite similar. It's everybody is able to come up with ideas Everybody has theories and desires on where a product should go, but it's only through multiple layers of filtering that you get to something, which is uh, the, the ideal end result and the things you actually build. So th this is one example. I, th this is not the Latera strategy. Uh, we, we have multiple uh, conveyor belts of information flowing through this process. But we, we don't have anything like this visualized. But this does give an example of, of what you could be looking at. So you see this is a funnel as well. You have on the left-hand side, there's a filter. And then you move through a series of processes. So the first item, and 
it's good to have this visualized here because you can see lots of dots all pointing in different directions. And the strategic filter for a company is, is making sure that the ideas that you have in front of you are those which mean that you're roughly heading in the, the same direction for, for all those ideas. So the bigger a company gets or the bigger its teams get, the more, the more strategies you might have going on at the same time. But that's, that's an aspect of capacity rather than an aspect of, uh, an aspect of being able to balance multiple items. So you can have, if you have three development teams, each can perhaps be contributing towards a different aspect of the company's strategy. But as a general rule of thumb, the more focused you are, the, the more results you get out of this process. So this filter, that blue thing is what's being carried through the process. Everything else you effectively put in a shoebox, and when it aligns with your strategy again, it gets brought back out. But up until that point, it's left, which is kind of the first place where product teams and product managers have to learn to say no. It's it can be very frustrating and also quite disheartening to have an excellent idea put in front of you, but it doesn't meet your strategic vision and has to go on pause, but it happens. And as long as the strategy is sound, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that you're building evidence for changing strategy in the future. Then you get to the selection points where you have to work out whether it will be viable or whether it will make good business sense. So if you have a, a strategy of wanting to expand into the Australian market and the, the solution might be, and I'm talking as a business rather than as a, as a product organization just to begin with, is we could fly over from North America, our entire sales team, and then just go door to door, cold calling and knocking on doors and talking to people and trying to drum up interest that way. That, that might pass the strategic filter because it's in line with the vision. You want to expand in Australia, but then there's the economic filter. Uh, one, that will cost thousands upon thousands of dollars. And two, would that actually be effective? So you, so you start to filter the, this pure and unrefi unrefined idea through the lenses of, does this make sense to the business? Does this make sense to the direction you want to move into? And, and then you get into building the actual project pipeline. And this is where the, the roadmap can be helpful. So what we see here in this actual pipe here corresponds more to the very short-term product roadmap. So, so say you're building something over the span of a year, what's in here could just be over the course of say three months, but it does start to create that link to how the ideas come in and how everything that goes through that process links to the higher roadmap, which in turn links to the strategy, which in turn applies to all these ideas that are coming through, which are either being continued with or being, uh, being left to the side for the time being. This is why it, without regularly reviewing the strategy itself, uh, products, you know, products and companies can become a bit stale and, and maybe they do turn into the feature factories that I mentioned earlier. If that strategy never changes, then it effectively just becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. The strategy remains the same. You, you produce the features and they in turn dictate what the strategy is and that in turn dictates the ideas and there's, there's no real new input. So this process here has an analysis of failures to understand whether you're not hitting the mark. I mentioned about two weeks ago, how the product team sets OKRs, objectives and key results, to have something to measure against and give an opportunity to just be clear about what you're achieving or what you're missing. Uh, as a company, Litera, what we generally do is we review this entire cycle once a year. So towards the end of the year or start of the year, we'll review everything that's come in through these filters and then also our business objectives and what the strategy is that aligns to that. And then and see whether it needs to be changed or not. And most years we'll think, we'll discover that maybe one project level will need to extend into the year and that's fine, but overriding company themes change. 
So if that fits under that, uh, under that umbrella, then it can stay. If it doesn't fit under that umbrella, then we need to start wrapping it up and putting it to bed because it's not going to last much further into the new year. So this is a, a short overview of, I suppose, our process and how our pipeline would work. It's not a pipe, of course, but it gets a little bit of the way towards showing what you would expect to be. So this first part here is all of those individual ideas as, as they crop up and as they come into the company. So multiple different ways that this can crop up. It's meeting with customers, it's hearing from customers through all sorts of different channels. And there's also what competitors are doing and, and the adoption of the things that we've released in the past to assess whether something that we released because we thought that it would contribute towards a particular strategy if, if that's gone well, then it seems like we had the right idea. If it's not going well, then it seems as something additional that we should be considering that maybe we weren't. And then it's just prioritizing and working out which need to come first. And that's a little bit of that is the, is the business economic filter. So you can have, say, 100 ideas and I mentioned earlier, putting them into a shoebox or, or keeping them to the side. That is one way of looking at it. it. It's whether you make the formal decision to say, we're not going to commit to this and we're not going to move it forward uh, effectively at all. Whereas some companies will say, okay, we have a hundred items. We're gonna rank them from most to least important and the least important that they may never be done. But if we get through the top 99, then and nothing else comes in, then we'll do it. We, we tend to, again, do a blend of that approach. So we will pick the, the likeliest items, prioritize those, and the, the unlikely items effectively put a stamp on them saying, we're unlikely to co continue with this. And every so often we'll review that and see whether that remains the case. So again, here, ROI, demand, market impact, the, these are all business and economic filters. And then there's multiple methods of stakeholder review to assess whether these items which are now in the pipeline are, are valid or not. And I've already mentioned product councils, product committees. Those are two of the key ways this is covered. But of course, we, we can't have them right now, but things like water cooler conversations and in-person meetings and just catch-ups, these, these are all additional methods of sharing this information and trying to make sure that you're all on the same page as things have been progressed. And, and then it's just this cycle. I mentioned that our product release cycle occurs on a quarterly basis. The wider strategy cycle, I suppose, occurs on an annual basis. And that's all about making sure that whenever we have the opportunity to step back and assess what's happened, that we are able to understand the, the magnitude of what's, what's been delivered. So a few of these items here mostly correspond to that. Forecasting, of course, is for the more advanced items, which might require an entire project of themselves rather than a quarter to be achieved. And deal desk. Deal desk I may go into in some detail in a future session. That is effectively our way of managing and triaging issues that affect customers. So every, every bug that a customer reports, every, everything that could be potentially going wrong with a customer every, every week, and for some products that's multiple times a week, that is, is reviewed by a kind of a much like a product committee a multidisciplinary group of people who all have either some inputs or some connection with the customer to make sure those are progressed and understand what additional information is needed, if any. And as we see here, this iterates, this cycles, and this continues. So this is an illustration. It gets a bit messy as, as all practices do when they hit the reality of building something in a company with multiple people. So this illustrates the concept of 
when companies and it could be the entire company it can be a subset when when people get excited about the idea of a product and then require the product manager themselves to define it this illustration here is is hopefully the ideal situation where multiple steps and multiple measures occur but it can happen as well the, the desire for a particular product need is identified and then somebody is asked to go and run with it. So you have this task to define something. You, you know that maybe the engineering team will be finished with what they're currently working on in about four weeks. So that means you, you have four weeks to define the problem. Uh, you can use all sorts of best practices, assess the opportunity, and I will, I will go into a little bit more about opportunity assessment in a bit. And start interviewing users, better understand the problem that needs to be solved, identify early requirements. And then by week two, you should be able to start designing the, the prototype, whether that's with an interaction designer, whether that's wireframing. Um, and then in the third week, you'll start user testing using that prototype or framework. And then in week four, you'll flesh out the details of the use cases and review the prototype with the engineering team. Um, that, that sounds pretty good to me, but the, the reality of things isn't always in that case. So you can effectively find that in these initial user discussions, sometimes users aren't actually as excited about the idea as say the management team was when they suggested it. Or it's, it's difficult to produce a prototype that users are able to understand or walk through properly and users might just not be as excited about the ideas in the prototype when they try it. But at that point, you, you're finished, you have your time, you have your four weeks, the engineers are ready, and then for the next three to six months, it might just be that they have to build that. It's the, the product that you prototyped, identified, but it's kind of boring, unexciting, unusable. And then you get to the point where you ship and of course the results are lackluster and the management team is, is questioning what was done. So the problem there is not the software. It's not the engineering team's fault. They, they built to code and they built to spec and, and the blame can fall upon the product manager. And ultimately what that means is unless you're able to change your prototype adjust as, as you're creating, as you're testing with users, yeah, you're not going to produce the right thing and you're not going to get the results you want. So this is a bit more complicated than that simple four week, four step process, but it has multiple, multiple stages and multiple different interactions. It's, um, I'd say trying to create this neat characterization of what the product discovery cycle should look like, that can be one of the biggest traps for a product manager. It's, it's very, very tempting to want to have a reliable, consistent, understandable way of finding customers, talking to them, wireframing. Uh, but the reality is you'll, on week one, you'll start reaching out to people they won't get back to you for two weeks. You'll arrange meetings with people, they'll flake, and you'll start wireframing on what little information you've been able to get from customers. And then you'll start showing it to those customers and they don't like it. Then the people who flaked on you will get back in touch with you and you'll show them the wireframes and they'll suddenly like it. And you get all of these different, different points, different customer interactions at different stages in the refinement process. And it can be challenging and product discovery makes it sound kind of as amorphous as it is. And ultimately this can be a process of debate, but whether this process is more art or science. And, and I would say the, the urge to get processes in place, you can create a framework which gets most of it, but there have, does have to be some art or some creativity to pushing through the rest of the, the way. You can, you can engineer the building blocks that will make something uh, robust and supportable, 
But to get to that point of, of user delight, and here this is indicated by hearts and value being delivered, but delight is an actual metric that many companies measure. Um, that it takes a bit of a, a mental rewiring process to get through. And yeah, so you need to get a product solution that's usable, useful, feasible, sometimes delightful. And you effectively need to design, validate with customers and the engineering team and charge straight through this amorphous mass. So even with the help of multiple people, it's, it can still be a challenge. The pharmaceutical company, uh, industry, sorry, they provide a pretty good example of this. We, we work with a lot of people in life sciences and their discovery process is incredibly rife with potential ambiguity. So let me say the market's discovery it isn't necessarily very difficult. So there's all sorts of problems that need to be solved in terms of healthcare, whether that's uh, creating vaccines, creating uh, novel drugs for managing uh, completely mundane illnesses. You know, all sorts of those, all sorts of those problems would be great to solve. So there's no shortage of those. The issue is discovering what the solution is, and drug companies go into this discovery phase completely cognizant of the fact that there's no guarantee that you'll come up with anything and only vague understandings of how long that's actually going to take. So as a company, they have to build in that element of uncertainty into their structure and also into their pricing model. So software, I think we can get a little bit closer to that because there's... I'd say there's fewer complexities in software, but that may be a, an amateur's understanding. But it is a, a phase shift that management teams find difficult to reconcile. And that is one, I would say, this lack of predictability of the discovery process. There, there's this fear that you'll spend months and months working on discovery and then end up with nothing to show. And if you did at least build something and then ship it, you can point to something and say, we built and shipped something. Um, of course, if you go into this without that understanding and with a commitment to only build something which you know will solve an active problem and delight people, but you, you may never get to that solution, that can be challenging. And it can also be a, a fear of, of moving into Scrum or Agile processes because you can start out with a commitment to one particular release goal. And of course, with Agile, that could completely flip on its head at any point if the justification is there. And I would say second, the thought of the engineering team sitting around without anything valuable to do, again, can, can drive people up the wall because R&D spend is, is usually a, a fairly proportion, proportionate part of the business. Uh, huge as well, the amount of um, salary that's been thrown around, the amount of technological investment. So I, th I think that this discovery process here, it works. It's just that it, it can be difficult to expand the benefits of it. But if you're doing this, you, you will ultimately produce items for, for your roadmap or for your pipeline and they'll be well-designed and well-validated. And then there are additional things that you, can, you don't have to do as much validation for. There's, there's always maintenance. There's always direct customer requests and you know, canvassing the different endpoints to work out the number of people that requested it. And these can sometimes be very simple things that don't actually need much wireframing or much more prototyping or even much user validation. Sometimes it is just as simple as you need this done and you can flip a switch and make it happen. So I, I mentioned that I would talk about this. I will do so quite briefly, but this is an opportunity canvas. There's all sorts of different, different evolutions of this, different people who, who built them. I, I don't know who originated this, it might have been 
Marty Kagan. I think I first picked this up from the Strategizer series of books. But effectively, this is aiming to walk you through some of this discovery, some of these necessary questions that need to be asked. So opportunities exist all around. We've seen that in the pipeline. We've seen that in the, the number of ideas that come in. And things are always changing. So new tech, new people with different talents, competitors rising and falling. And this is a way of trying to quickly map which opportunities are promising and which ones aren't. And also, I use this quite a lot of the time for product ideas that we're not ready to deliver on, but we might want to be ready, ready for in any year or so. So if we leave the process of deciding whether or not to build a product or a particular feature to intuition, there's, there's intuition, there's large customers either offering to fund the creation of a particular feature or just saying it needs to be done and, and expecting it to be so. Those are two of the large ways that features can get built. Um, that's, that's quite a lot of the time. That's what businesses will be faced with. That'll be one of the pressures uh, being spanned across the product team. And one of the things that you need to be aware of. So typically somebody in the, the business side or marketing side will have a requirements document for marketing. And what this does is describe the opportunity rather than the solution. And so this here is, is the product team's approach at that very thing. So rather than leaping to understand what the solution needs to be, this starts with the premise that you can't quite do that until you fully understand what the problem is. And I've gone through multiple stages to understand that. So these have, just trying to see, there's 10 items here, although this one says one twice. Um, never let a glaring inaccuracy like that get in the way of, of doing something that might be beneficial. But usually the, the hardest one is, is the first question to answer, which is what problem is this going to solve? And effectively, what, what is the value proposition? So I will leave you with that. The next session, I, I don't actually have worked out yet. So we will we'll see. It may be that we have a short break on this series and then we'll continue with the uh, semi-frequent roundups of what's been happening in the product councils and product committees. But for now, if you are involved in not just product management, but any role which involves uh, incoming requests and being asked for particular items, it, this is a useful framework just to be starting to think about, am I actually solving, what, what kind of problem am I solving when I say, yes, I'll help with this? And what kind of solution can we giving that provides more value than simply doing something in the way that the person who has asked has, has strictly defined for me? So I guess that's more of a life lesson rather than the product management lesson, but that's generally how these things go. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and hopefully we'll be seeing more of this soon. Bye for now, everyone.